Hi, John McGrady back at you in the interview with the Famous Statistician series. And today I'm honored and thrilled to have my colleague, Dr. Brian Caffo here. Brian is on the faculty at the Bloomberg School of Biostatistics. He's an associate professor in the department. And he, he's been here for 11 years. He did his PhD at University of Florida under the tutelage of Jim Booth, who's now at Cornell. And when Brian got here, he hit the ground running. and has really established himself as a leader in many fields. And re most recently, in the past couple of years, he's been really focusing his efforts on big data that comes from imaging, MRIs, brain scans, et cetera. We've already talked to Ciprian Cranachano, and Brian, along with Ciprian, is a co-founder of the SMART group we talked about in that previous video, uh, the statistical methods for research and technology. So I'm gonna be talking to Brian about both his work in imaging, his thoughts on the state of statistical education, because he's also teaching a large open course vis-a-vis -vis Coursera, and I want to get his thoughts on the experience with that. So anyway, welcome to the show, Brian. Well, thanks. It's it's a pleasure to be on the John McGray Show. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> it's nice to hear I'm famous. That's I, right. Yes, no one exactly. told me that before. But <laughs> exactly. Well, we can edit that out, but um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So anyway, Brian, so um, tell us a little bit about the imaging data you work on, and what are some of sort of the... Um, potential public health and individual health outcomes that could be come from this type of study and some of the statistical and computational challenges of dealing with such large data sets. Right, okay, so so imaging holds, um, you know, it, it, it's as an existing technology is a, is a, has been a huge advance in medicine, right? So it, diagnostic imaging in particular is, has already been a, a huge advance. So several, the MRI, the... Yeah, <laughs> several Nobel Prizes have already been awarded in medicine and physics and other things for, um, for, for the impact that imaging has globally had. You know, C, CTs, you know, CAT scans are very common, MRIs are very common as diagnostic procedures. Um, then lately what I've been working on is um, a way to tweak the MRI scanner. So it's a, you know, a regular MRI scanner, maybe the magnet's a little bit stronger, but mm -hmm. a regular MRI scanner. And they put people, um, they put people in the scanner and they, they have them do things and they're getting images maybe every two seconds. And those images, they're, you know, they, they're, they're, they give you kind of a proxy for brain activation and you can study you know, how the brain, uh, um, you know, activates is maybe not the best word, but, but how, you know, sort of fluctuations and whatever this so-called fMRI signal is measuring as it relates to this task that they're performing, whether it's, you know, um, pressing a button, mm. you, could just, you could just have a person sitting there finger tapping, that's an easy one, it gets nice motor cortex activation, or you could have them doing a visual task, or you could have them, and it, it was a way to, um, you know, kind of codify this model of sort of functional specialization in the brain that different brain areas localize different brain functions. And so, so that technology has been a very interesting um, breakthrough and has led to a lot of really good basic science. And then I'm interested in kind of a next use of this technology where they stick people in the scanner and then they do nothing. <laughs> and so, uh, where well, the person does nothing, the scanner is the scanner still right. scanning, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess. Um, and uh, that so-called resting state. It turns out while you're at rest, and you know, it's not exactly clear what rest means. Mm -hmm. You know, you're still introspecting or thinking or whatever. But while you're at rest, um, your brain is still quite active, and 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 these kind of spontaneous, uh, synchronous resting state signals. Uh, highlight various brain networks and the brain networks are interesting and we think that they might be related to various diseases so there's a lot of interest in this area in in seeing if it can do things like predict Alzheimer's disease uh, well before the onset of Alzheimer's disease there's a lot of interest in whether or not it will shed some light on pediatric disorders like autism and attention deficit hyperactive disorder um, and, um, and, and I'll get back to autism in a second because that's particularly interesting. Um, and then in another study, we're you know we're interested in people who are in, uh, for example, in comas, and there you can't have them do a task while they're sure. in the scanner. Mm -hmm. So so their resting state is is the only sort of functional MR um, paradigm at your disposal, and the idea is maybe uh, interconnectivity 
uh, of these estimated brain networks might inform who's going to have good eventual outcomes related to traumatic brain injury. And maybe if you knew that, you could develop therapies, just like maybe if you knew who was going to get Alzheimer's disease, you would, you would be able to target therapies. Mm -hmm. um, so the preventative therapies or yeah, to help to yeah. slow the progression or something like that? And then, so you asked a little bit about big data. Mm -hmm. and, and, and my, uh, so I'm not 100% sure what big data is. We, we have, you know, kind of ter terabytes of data. We don't have large numbers of subjects, though right. that's changing a little bit. But, but every subject has a lot of measurements. So we're kind of like the standard big data problem with the data turned on its side. <laughs> Small n, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, but just in terms of computing, in terms of computing, speed, we run into deal, all right? the same problems. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, but what I'm most interested in in terms of big data is is very um, having as tight as possible scientific hypotheses. So in autism, as an example, I work with a group at Kennedy Krieger that includes um, um, Stuart Mostowski and Jim Picard and uh, several of their uh, people working in their labs, as well as uh, several people working in the SMART uh, group here at Hopkins, which, by the way, we have a vanity website, www.smart-stats.org. That's right. I want so, to put the link in the description here. That's you right. So uh, go to smart-stats, and, you know, it's ours, so you can't <laughs> you can't have smart stats anymore. Um, <laughs> I've been trying, but... Yeah, yeah everyone's been trying. Chicken, so. We've been getting bids, but we're squatting on it now. I've got reasonably intelligent <laughs> stats. <down. laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. So I bought that domain <laughs> name. <laughs> so... So, uh, just but, but back to big data, um, you take autism as an example. One thing I'm, you know, they're interested in and they've gotten me interested in is this sort of tight coupling between um, motor dysfunction that's apparent in autism and that that motor dysfunction would imply potential uh, disruption in brain connectivity or, or potential um, slowed development in brain connectivity and it's possible that we could maybe measure that the brain connectivity via fMRI or if not mm. fMRI maybe MEG, maybe EEG, maybe any of these other technologies for measuring um, uh, brain connectivity and and the fact that we have this tightly controlled statistical hypothesis relating directly to motor network and specific kind of inner hemispheric motor network overflow type uh, problems, um, then, uh, then it really cuts the big data problem down substantially. We, we know kind of where to look. You know, we, we have a lot fewer, no we just have a lot fewer numbers to deal with, but, but more importantly, the data isn't asked to, to perform double and triple and quadruple duty. We, we, you know, we've come up with a hypothesis and we'd like to use the data to evaluate it. We're not using the data to simultaneously to find. find the hypothesis and evaluate it. So yeah. I, I, I don't know how well that adheres to the kind of modern big data movement, but that's how I like to do things. And so it cuts um, down at least some of the... Yeah, and it's more fun that way because, you know, well, in sure. this study we have, you know, you know a neuroscientist, a biophysicist, lots of... Um, you know, uh, biomedical engineers, signal processing, statisticians, everyone all working together, and we're rallying behind a, a scientific hypothesis. And so I, I, I like it. I like the study being done that way, and I, and I have sort of gravitated towards collaborators that work in that manner. Excellent. Well, that's a really, for my next question, that really segues in nicely. I mean, you're dealing with complicated spatial temporal data. You've narrowed down your hypotheses, but you still have to deal with the within person over time correlations, yes. et cetera, et cetera. How do you, you know, when you end up fitting complicated models to deal with this difficult correlation structure, let me ask you this, how much do they rely on sort of the basics of statistics that we sort of lay down in introductory courses? And B, how do you communicate this to clinicians and researchers, the results of these, who can help try and understand what they mean in terms of the scientific diet? Right. So um, we, you know, we try to do the simplest possible thing that answers the questions that we look for. But there's, you know, fortunately in this, you know, maybe unfortunately uh, in general, but fortunately for statisticians, there's kind of enough meat on the bone where the very simplest things need to be improved on a little bit in order to get information. So the simplest thing you could do in some of these cases is just pick spots in the brain and look at correlations between the, the spots where you pick. Mm -hmm. um, but that has a problem in that, sure. you know, what if really the correlations are nearby and not exactly in the spots that you pick? There's this all this arbitrariness and subjectivity in how you pick those spots. And so we try to, to um, 
so in that case, we have to do kind of more complicated things, um, but we try to keep them as simple as we possibly can. Um, but most of it, you know, most of it kind of goes back to core statistical techniques. You know, it, you know, ultimately what we're interested in in the brain connectivity problem is is uh, correlations. Okay. So it it does in this case all go back to uh, empirical correlations and the strength of the empirical correlations and do these empirical correlations differ between say people with severe autistic symptoms at, at, a, at a fixed age versus people with uh, less severe autistic symptoms or compared to controls or maybe comparing across ages and that sort of thing. So, so just an extension of the Pearson correlation? Yeah, is so it is in a idea. lot of ways what we're doing is an extension of the Pearson correlation but then you know with a you know I guess with, with substantial Twist, twist, twist and yeah. fanciness added on top of it, but, but it does go back to but that. But it starts yeah. with that idea. Yeah. Great. Well, Byron, as I noted, is also a pioneer because, you know, I felt like I was a big deal teaching an online course to over 200 people. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought like I was the king of the online stats world, but Brian has recently, or is in the process now of teaching an online course through Coursera to over 15,000 students, and it's called Biostatistics Bootcamp, is that right? Mathematical, Mathematical. Biostatistics Bootcamp. Excellent, excellent. And so can, so you're one of the first faculty here at Hopkins to do this, and actually one of the first faculty to teach statistics vis-a-vis -vis Coursera. So can you just tell us a little bit about your experience so far, and what you think about the future for MOOCs? Uh, what is that massive open online courses, courses yeah. et cetera, and what do you think the students can get out of this and how it expands the audience and the reach of our field? Yeah, so um, it's, it's, it's been a blast for me. Um, it's, it's just been incredibly fun, just, just to, to, so other people know where our department is offering, uh, at least right now, three Coursera mm -hmm. courses. The, the course that I'm offering, Mathematical Biostatistics Bootcamp, and then Roger Pang, who I think and we've interviewed, interviewed yet. We've interviewed um, Archer, and we've interviewed Jeff actually. And so. and Jeff Leake both have courses. One on statistical programming in R, and Jeff is going to do what what I consider to be the the most ambitious of the three projects because it's not clear how to do what he's pr proposing to do in a massive online setting. It's not clear how to do it in person, but teach a course on kind of legitimate data analysis, something that that tries to bring in all the intricacies of um, data analysis into a classroom format and then scale it up to 50,000 students. So his, his is a very ambitious project. Mine was um, far less ambitious because... It was very ambitious nevertheless, but... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I would say. Um, but it was far less ambitious because I picked something that, that we historically know pretty well how to teach and it's... Um, sort of the underpinnings it's of basic... It's annealed a little bit as maybe the right word I can think of. So I'm teaching a lot of you know, mathematics, statistics, probability, and you know, there the, a lot of the stuff is very old. It's sort of um, solidified in the manner to, in w the the right way to teach them, or the ideas at least, and and they're amenable to um, evaluation via things like um, multiple choice tests and and that sort of thing. But it's been a great experience. You know, um, I have to say your kind of your pioneering with iTunes University and the online MPH and the schools pioneering with that has given us this, um, you know, collective distance ed um, educational support staff at the university that has made it really easy for me. So I have to say that that has just, yeah, they've made I, I think, very easy too. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that has, has been, uh, I don't know that I could have done it without their help. Um, but then, uh, in terms of the goal of Coursera, well, you know, there's some altruistic goals and there's some selfish goals. Sure. Mm -hmm. So the altruistic ones is, you know, it's it's you know, we want to reach a broader audience. We want to educate people. We want to, you know, I'm very committed to kind of open teaching, open knowledge. So all the course materials are on GitHub. You know, we open source all the software that we use, and um, so there's that aspect. There's the aspect to to teaching to people who will never have the opportunity to, you know, study it at, at a top tier world university. Um, you know, the the other forty seven percent would like to, <laughs> <laughs> would like to teach to, uh, to them. Uh, there's the you know, there's the aspect that, you know, for, for us and, and lots of people like us in the world we're, we're not going to go to a university again. Right. We're not going to, you know, and lots of people in all walks of life are, you know, they're not going to go back and attend a, a four-year college again or graduate school. And, but they want to learn and they, they, learn, they want yeah. to, you know, I, you know, I think 
for me personally, if I wanted to take a course, I would be it would be far uh, it would be far easier and better for me to do something like Coursera. Uh, so so for these kind of continuing education purposes, I think it's 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 very it's it's good. And then there's the the less altruistic <laughs> reasons for doing is that it's a great amount of exposure for our department. It's you know it's disruptive, and we wanted to be on the front of the disruption, not in the back. You know we. There's a storm coming, and sure. we'd at least like to have a raincoat on instead of the. <laughs> right. I think maybe some other schools are see the storm coming and are heading to the beach. Right. Right? <laughs> uh, so there's that. There's that aspect, and you know, I also had our graduate program, and I, I think it would be, you know, I think you know the the courses that we're offering would would be good at advertising for our graduate program. Okay. And Give them a window of how we think about education. Yeah. So there's, there's also there's several yeah, sure. uh, no, I mean, non altruistic reasons for the department and personally and that that sort of thing to, to, to do it. But then there's but you know I think our main purpose was to you know to try it and and see how it went and and really honestly to to disseminate information and teaching as widely as possible. Excellent. And will you be offering this again? Do you think? I'd love to. You know mm -hmm. it's. You know, it's not, I, I don't know how much that is up to me, okay. but mm -hmm. I would love to offer it again. But I, you know, I, so I, I can't guarantee, mm -hmm. you know, what the school's designs are and the university's designs are and their involvement with Coursera, because I don't know. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do know that, you know, I can just continue to put stuff on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The internet is, is right for the No, one, up, no right? one seems to stop me from doing that. So <laughs> at some level, I'll offer me, if it's not Coursera, it'll be something. So uh, yeah. So at some level, I'll be doing it. I mean, at the bare minimum, I'll maintain the GitHub repository. I put the lecture notes on OpenCourseWare, which I, I'm sure will keep going. We'll include a link for that, uh, both the Coursera link and the uh, OpenCourseWare link in the video description as well. So. Yeah. And I saw today that there was a Google course hosting yeah, they're site. releasing a platform. Yeah, yeah. So a that, platform, so, so I could just do that and mm -hmm. teach it myself. But you know, if I wanted to, you know, it's time. It does it's take time. time. Right? And, mm -hmm. um, but it's fun. It's really fun. It's really. It was really interesting. The first day was very eye-opening when I went to the forums and I just saw the amazing collection of places where people were from, and that on day one. You know, there's like a, a, a mathematical biostatistics boot camp study group breaking out in Moscow, in the Netherlands. <laughs> it's and it, awesome. It's just to unbelievable that. to read to to, to read those that, things. Yeah. yeah. So that was that was very fun. That was the most fun aspect of it so far. Was that first day of the forum. Excellent, excellent. Well, Brian, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. Oh, thank you. Um, and like I say, we'll put the links to uh, both the Smart Group and then Brian's course on Coursera and the Open Courseware mm -hmm. version we have at Hopkins, so you can check it out. And until next time. Yeah, and keep doing smart stats. And keep doing smart stats. <laughs> <laughs> and we're trying to come up with some branding here. That's I think that sounds pretty sexy, actually. <laughs> keep doing smart stats. <laughs>